Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. The story of China amazes all of us. Since especially the Galwan, a lot many of us in India have tried to find out what exactly is the story behind China. How did it land up to being what it is today? How did it grow to what it is today? And what is the history of this region that calls itself the Middle Kingdom? There has to be a grand strategy for any country that wants to reach the top spot. To discuss this entire thing, I have with me Major General Rajiv Narayan, who's done a comprehensive study on this entire thing. And uh, before we begin, sir, thank you so much for, you know, I believe you prepared a presentation and a slideshow for us, as well as a huge chunk of information that will benefit a lot many of us budding China watchers to take the story forward, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Adi. Thank you for giving me this platform. And I do hope at the end of it, uh, the layman can understand what China is. Absolutely. So let's begin. So why don't you tell us, you know, uh, let's, let's see the presentation. Why don't you tell us, uh, in your opinion, how did this whole story of China begin? So just one thing I'd like to mention to all the viewers before we begin with your presentation is that this is going to be a three-part show. We're going to be, because it's a long history of a country that we're talking about with the CCP and so on and so forth. This is just the part one where we will probably cover the first section of the development of the CCP and how things went across and what were the philosophies that actually came in, post which we will talk about the part two and three. So thank you, sir, for once again making the presentation and let's begin. Okay. Now, uh, well, the history, if you go back into history of China, it's been ebb and flow. Various kingdoms came big and became smaller as the power uh, improved. But uh, though it's not here, one fascinating aspect has always been that the kingdom of China, whether it be the ha Tang dynasty or all the other Yuan, Ming, unless they controlled Sichuan and Gansu, they could never expand. Because the passes into Tibet and Xinjiang were controlled by these provinces. So a king, Han kingdom, uh, Historically, Sichuan and Gansu and all have not been part of the Han heartland, which I'll show later in the map, uh, the essence of the Han heartland when I talk about China's uh, security strategy as part of its grand strategy. Uh, the story we should uh, see from the Qing dynasty. Uh, while we talk of uh, 800 years of outsiders ruling us, starting from Mohammed Ghori, who came from Afghanistan, China has a similar story. Around the 13th century, mid 1200s is when the Mongols captured China, the Yuan dynasty. Kublai Khan is known as Yuan. He established the Yuan dynasty and he spread China <coughs> into Central Asia also. They were outsiders. There was a brief period of Han control by the Ming, but after that came the Qing dynasty who were actually Manchurians. Mm -hmm. Manchuria, as you know, North China is not part of Han to protect from the Jin kingdom, the Manchus and all, uh, they had over many uh, kingdoms, they made this great wall to protect themselves from the Mongol hordes. And the Man last dynasty to rule was the Manchus and only after that now, uh, when the Republic was formed that the Han took control of China back again. So essentially from the 13th century till the 20th century, they were ruled by outsiders. So that is the reason why I'm going to take this history, starting from the establishment of Republic. Mm -hmm. So basically Dr. Sun Yat Sen and the Republic and then the warlordism, Chiang Kai-shek, his standoff with the Red Army, which led to the Long March, 
and the arrival of the Japanese and World War II, and which gave the rise of the dragon, the PLA. That is the dragon rose then. These are the two prominent figures during the Republic time, Dr. Sun Yat Sen. I will be talking about his work, uh, works later when I discuss the grand strategy, what he gave. Mm. Because that was implemented only by Tang Xiaoping onwards, not by Mao. Uh, he is the one who is respected across both sides of the Taiwan Straits. He is the one who established the Republic, the First Republic, 1911. But he was soon overthrown by the figure on the right, the General Yung, uh, Shikai, Yuan Shikai. He was the leader of the CNC of the Beiyang Army. Beiyang in Chinese Mandarin means northern ocean. So they were essentially from the north and uh, around the Bohai Sea mm -hmm. and Beijing and uh, further up Shandong and Liaoning, these areas they were part of. So hence the name Beiyang Army, but this was the strongest army that the king had, the Qing dynasty had. And they came with Sun Yat-sen, he overthrew him he wanted to become the emperor, but he died in early 1920s. And Sun Yat-sen came back again as the president of the republic, along with Chiang Kai-shek. But unfortunately, Sun Yat-sen died in 24, and then began the rise of Chiang Kai-shek. He was his uh, protege, and he's the one who raised the National Republican Army, NRA, and he was the command, he became the commander in chief of that. And he was called the Generalissimo. Mm. And uh, he used the, uh, the Soviets helped him to gain strength to overthrow the warlords. And the CPC initial stages also worked with them. So he is also known as the Red Army in history uh, or the Red General. I stand corrected in history. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. There are a lot of quotes, I will say here, which is incorrectly given to Mao. When they say that they can be only one sun or they can be only one tiger in the hill. It is actually, they can be only one sun in the sky. And that Chiang Kai-shek had said, uh -huh. not Mao. Mao quoted him. But original statement that they can be only one sun in the sky is Chiang Kai-shek and which the Chinese follow even today. Correct. And that's why they have a problem with rising India in Asia. That's Chiang Kai-shek. CPC was founded initially in 1921 and they had a very small militia with them at that time. Nothing much to write home about. But with the Soviet help, even then they had started uh, subverting people within the NRA. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so Chiang Kai-shek came to power and he started attacking the warlords. When, the, uh, when uh, Yuan Shikai died, his chiefs in various regions, they became the warlords and they were dictating terms. Something like what happened in Afghanistan after the Americans left mm. initially in the early 90s, till the Taliban came in. There were warlordism everywhere. Same in China. He is the one who overthrew a whole lot of them. But he became suspicious of the uh, CPC. CPC. Mm -hmm. And he started attacking them. So that was when the Red Army, that is the Workers and Peasants Red Army, was formed on 1st August 1927. And there was open war after that between the NRA and the uh, Red Army. The, uh, below you can see on the left the flag of uh, PLA with the star. The uh, figures that you see on the side indicates 1st August in Mandarin. Uh -huh. So they have it on their flag itself, the star and 1st August. That is the raising. 1st August 27 is the raising of the PLA. And 
that is why july 2021 the 200s of she 2021 is was so critical for him because the cpc was formed the first time in 2021 now when they got defeated very badly they had this long march as you can see on the right that map indicates the various regions from where the red army pulled back and it was mao who controlled them all of them they were very demoralized and that is the point from where mao tse tung became a prominent figure in the red army he was also one of the founding members of the cpc but he was not that strong at that point in time it is here that he made his mark then he realized one thing that unless you have the people with you something like what uh, the uh, communist party of russia had done against the tsars he started that and these were the three rules and eight points he dictated to his people and which he said you have to follow these orders in the rural area this meant a lot to the local people because he was in the north now he was also benefited that uh, when he was in the north the soviet union was next to him but the soviet union itself in uh, that period of time was going through stalin's purges mm. so there was nothing much they could do to support so he lay low and his biggest uh, you could say luck the greatest luck that he had was that was the time when uh, the japanese from manchuria attacked beijing and attacked china so soviet union got around to chiang kai shak and the cpc that you need to join hands to uh, counter the japanese so from 37 to 41 whatever little they had the cpc agreed to help chiang kai shak mm. but post 41 they did nothing of that sort because by then the moscow had been defended by the uh, soviets and they knew that the germans had reached their limit and it was just a matter of time before the uh, soviet soviet union would go on the counter offensive so the from that time onwards they started protecting themselves and gaining weapons and equipment from the soviets and Uh, gaining their strength and spreading their mass rural base into the peasants mm -hmm. and that is the rise of mao era once the japanese surrendered from the north most of the weapons the soviets made sure were given to the uh, the cpc so that is the weapons with which mao then fought the civil war 45 to 49 and 49 the prc was formed but the mao era was a very 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 tumultuous period as far as china was concerned very poor on the economy he didn't want to and uh, he also like she i personally feel had megalomaniac uh, attitude he wanted to show that he is he was a, a very avid follower of stalin mm -hmm. he they were very he looked up to stalin so he he wanted to show that he can do it himself so he debunked most of sunyat sen what sunyat sen wanted i am saying most uh, it's a very thought out word because sunyat sen had wanted in 22 that china for its growth needs to colonize colonize today is a bad word but when he is talking in the early 20th century there were colonies everywhere understood yes colonize manchuria yunnan whole of tibet whole of xinjiang whole of mongolia whole of ladakh all these re agar sichuan and gansu all these regions he wanted them to be colonized and you will get to know how great a thinker he was when i talk about the security aspect of uh, guarding china so most of it 
Mao did it in the 50s. Though not whole of Mongolia, Nei Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, hmm. he has taken control of. He had taken control of Manchuria, Yunnan, Sichuan, Gansu, Tibet, and uh, Xinjiang. Xinjiang. And when he took over Tibet, by the way, their connectivity was not that good. Initial period in the 50, early 50s, rice was sent from India. <laughs> So people should not forget, we gave them the rice, otherwise PLA wouldn't have survived there. They, like I said, they were only limited passes through which you could come. He At had... Moment, sir, may I just take this moment to yeah, slap, yeah. My, uh, slap myself for this particular thing? Because <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but uh, uh, just a small thing. So, the, you know, the previous slide was very interesting. And I'd like you to, by towards the end of the conversation, I'd really request you to kind of bring this out quite carefully that the three rules and eight points uh, that Mao had established for the CPC does not in any way relate to the current CPC and the way that they're behaving. No, no. See, understand the psyche of the CPC. Whatever rules, whatever agreements, whatever is done is for the benefit at that point in time. Ah. Once he's stronger enough, then it all goes it. out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it all goes out because he's strong now. So that now tells he you will the dictate philosophy. The that tells you the philosophy. Yes, sir. That is the philosophy. Sir, okay. wonderful. Please, sir. So his first and the famous industrialization plan was that every house can make steel. And he wanted to become the biggest steel maker in the world. Smelter, yes, sir. The great leap forward. Now, you can't have a farmer, a poor farmer who's been tilling his land and tell him to convert his house into a smelter and start doing industry. It was a colossal failure. He was losing power at that time. And lo and behold, it all played into his hands and you had the 62 war. And uh, he gained back his power in China. Like in the 50s, when he entered in the Korean War, he had, of course, the support of Soviet Union. The biggest worry for CPC at that time was that towards the southern portion of China, there were still supporters of uh, KMT, Kaomintang. Uh -huh. okay. He had not yet got full control. See, Tibet, Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. Xinjiang, he had taken over. Tibet, he had not yet taken over. Xinjiang operations were going on. Nei Mongolia was still to be taken over. And at that time, if you had a capitalist uh, country on his doorstep, after all, the Yalu River is what separates North Korea from uh, China. That was the worry. And so he went in. By going in and achieving a stalemate against a superpower which had won the allies who had won the Second World War was a big gaining of face and for his standing within the CPC. And to be able to curb the NRA supporters and the Kaumintang supporters in the South. Okay. And concurrent with the attack there, he attacked Tibet. It went concurrently with the Korean War. 50s. 50s. Yeah. Okay. But after having done that, he did this great leap forward, which was a colossal failure. Now, he had uh, a lot of enemies within the CPC. How do you cover up for that? You tell that the people have not understood what I wanted. So they need to be retutored into how socialism works. And that's the great proletarian cultural revolution along with his red brigade and he used it to purge all his opponents. Tang Xiaoping was purged. Xi Jinping's dad was also purged. Okay. Again, this was a massive failure. From 62 to 72, they wanted to do this. It was a 10 years. It was a debacle. Millions died. There was starvation, famine, 
because the great leap forward and cultural revolution followed back to back you sent mm -hmm. away professors and everything to understand rural thing now a scientist you are going and telling him start tilling the field he knows nothing no abcd about agriculture how will he survive so that was the time when feelers were sent through poland of to from china to usa okay uh, mao never liked khrushchev he hated khrushchev and now that they were in a debacle he wanted that to tell uh, indicate to the americans that they could be a balancing factor against the russians they already had a standoff with russia over the usuri river so 69 sir hmm. uh, 1967 68 69 they had these problems so that was around about the period 68 69 when they reached out to the americans and not what the pakistanis would have have us believe that they were the ones who facilitated nonsense it was through the polish embassy okay interesting and but it came about in 71 well known as the ping pong diplomacy mm. uh, where our man uh, henry kissinger and nixon they opened up right. though the maximum opening up happened uh, around 79 onwards 71 mm -hmm. they permitted prc to sit on the table mm. though prc is there on the table if you go back to the charter of the un it says republic of china still says Republic of China and not People's Republic of China. That's a very interesting thing. <laughs> okay. Though PRC sits as a permanent member in the uh, Security Council. Security Council. But the article there has not been amended as yet. So after that comes actually the rise of China. Tang Shaoxing period. Mm. 76 when Mao died till 79 was the period where Tang Xiaoping struggled against the gang of four where Mao's wife was there along with three more who wanted to control but he came up but he still didn't have the full support of the PLA that was number one number two Taiwan was showing eyes to them uh, uh, sorry not Taiwan uh, Vietnam mm. And Vietnam had gone in and overthrown the uh, Khmer Rouge government in Cambodia. Cambodia. Which was supported by China. Khmer Rouge was supported by China. That was the reason. And uh, the Soviets had said that they were the strategic partners with Vietnamese. And that was the period of time when the Soviet Union was about to get into Afghanistan. The trainers had already gone. The king yeah. had been overthrown by Daud, and their trainers had already gone. And they were about to enter because Daud was to be overthrown at that point in time. And he timed it geopolitically very correctly when he went into Vietnam. Tactically, a biggest blunder by the PLA. They suffered enormous casualties mm -hmm. because the Viet Cong had just beaten the uh, su uh, superpower, the Americans, and they were masters in uh, guerrilla warfare. So they un unleashed guerrilla warfare on the Chinese. The Chinese had forgotten by then the art of guerrilla warfare. They went conventional and they were hit by guerrilla warfare and they lost at one count. Some people say about two lakh of the soldiers were killed. My God. Yeah, quite a lot. They pulled back. Though it has not been confirmed, I am showing the highest figure, but they suffered heavily. Geostrategically, it was a master stroke. The Soviets never came to help. Soviets never came to help. So for the regional countries, its immediate neighbor, the word went out that China is the boss. The Soviets never came. So at the geostrategic level, it was a master stroke. At the strategic level, he had sorted out the PLA. Because when they came back, 
he was able to purge people and throw people, all those people out. And they were, because uh, they knew that it was a disaster as far as PLA is concerned uh, in the battles. So after that was when he started following, this is what are the teachings of Sun Yat Sen. He had said three principles, nationalism, centralized government and centralized economy. The while nationalism and centralized government had been brought in by uh, Mao, centralized economy is where he failed because he tried to do the economy his way. Whereas Tang Xiaoping brought in, which has been made famous by uh, repeatedly being quoted by Xi Jinping with Chinese characteristics. So, so he brought in socialism with Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. In short, capitalism with socialist characteristics. Because he is the first one who said it is never, it's not uh, bad to be rich. Correct, sir. Tang Xiaoping. The second one, which is the most famous of it, and I would recommend all uh, people who are watching China to read, is the book which I frontispiece of the book which I have shown. International Development of China written by Sun Yat-sen. You cannot have a more detailed book. I have not seen it till date even for India. With maps laying out everything, how to develop the ports, which are the ports to be developed, what all would be needed, road connectivity, rail connectivity, how to get the power generation, how to connect everything and how to go about it, but using international aid. And the subtle point he has made is how to learn from the West to become better than them. That was the essence of what he was telling. And Tang Xiaoping did that. But before we go into it, we must understand what is the worldview of China. This all Chinese are taught right from their childhood in school. Xu Jing classic, Middle Kingdom. Actually, the Middle Kingdom is the center of the universe yes. for them. Mm. And there are five concentric circles which emanate out from the seat of power. That is the royal domain, the pacific domain, pacification domain, zone of allied tributaries and the zone of barbarians. Nothing has changed from that. I'll show it in graphics later what I mean by that. The other one is Zhao Ting Yang, a Chinese professor in 2005 and another book he wrote in 2009. He sp speaks of something called Tianzia. Tianzia means under the heaven system. Now, when you, uh, in Manchurian, you have uh, characters, you don't have alphabets, mm. it's characters. So mm. how you pronounce the intonation you use and the context in which it use gives the meaning. So it can mean all under the heaven, it can mean anything. But in this context, when you read what he's writing, it means Chinese empire. That is all the world institutions, what are there extant are not good enough and all these have to be with Chinese characteristics. And I'll show you later what all they have brought into place. It's all there. Eyes wide open, the West knows it is there. But nothing has been done about it. And the third thing they talk about it is the rejuvenation. What is the rejuvenation? They had a middle kingdom. Mm -hmm. Then there was a century of humiliation. The century of humiliation, they uh, consider it from the opium wars. And for one century, that was going on. And then they take the ending from 1949 when PRC was formed. Now comes the revival under the PRC, the rejuvenation, rise of China, and going back to the Middle Kingdom, where all roads will lead to China. When we talk of BRI, I'll show you how all roads lead to China. And uh, this is what is the system they have. Now, when we talk of the uh, concentric circles, this is what is the concentric circle. I've taken it from the book written by Jack Martin. You must read When China Rules the World. 
the end of the Western world and the birth of a new global order published in 2009 by Penguin. So you have the capital, the royal domains, the pacification zone, allied tributary, and the zone of barbarians. Now, when you see it in the manner in which they're going about, how does it relate to the present world? So the capital area is the Han heartland, royal domains, Yunnan, Manchuria, pacification domain, you have, oh, sorry, the pacification domain, you have Xinjiang, Tibet, allied tributaries, Asia, North Africa, Eastern Africa. Are they looking at a whole of Africa as their tributary or not? Don't know. Rest of the world is zone of barbarians as far as they are concerned. India is the odd one out here because you are not buying into any of China's policies and that is what hurts him because as per them, they can be only one sun in the sky. A rise of India shows that there can be an alternate system to the Chinese with which you can still rise. If that happens, then you have two sons in Asia. And that cannot be countenanced by China. So they are showing even Xi Jinping in all his speeches in the new year, keeps telling the people of the region, follow our policies, follow our systems. Mm. And here is India, which is not following the system and rising. So the first thing that Tang Xiaoping did was to change the matrix of how national power is uh, indicated. On the West, I have shown the US and the Western construct of national power, diplomacy, economy, military. Last is information because these days information has become the new oil. Mm. And they, that's where they brought in that time system. Diplomacy, information, military, and economy. economy. Okay. Now, in this, the Chinese brought a very important vertical. They learned how they came to power by subverting the human. That's how the support and that's how they gained power in the civil war. So the most important vertical for them is the human power. And this metric was laid out in 1985 by Tang Xiaoping and his scholars. The human factor as a new pillar was brought in and that he termed it as comprehensive national power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, the West, when you read their all their things, they always termed it earlier as national power. Here was the term coined comprehensive national power, where they brought in the human element. Now, different scholars give different matrix, uh, sub matrix within diplomacy, economy, military, and other things, but these were the main pillars that were established. Nothing very different from what Chanakya had mentioned earlier, which we have forgotten. And I'll just show it. Chanakya, when he, in his Chanakya Niti, Arth Shastra, seven elements of power he had spoken about. The ruler, the ministers, people in territory, economy, security, armed forces, and the allies. Now, when you come to a democratic state, you have the ruler and the ruling party. You have ministers, people, territory, economy. You have security, internal, external, armed forces. You have allies, internal, external, and you have the opposition parties also. And I have not, this is the uh, power structure within a governance system that you had then, and I've tried to make it today. Now you find everything is controlled by, except territory. Everything else is controlled by man, human factor. Economy is also a human element. You can disrupt, you have strikes, you have close downs, you have everything taking place. You have, so that is what is how they uh, do the subversion. So this has been an interesting episode uh, where we've gone through quite a bit, as a matter of fact, to create a baseline for our study of China. It'll be interesting to see how things develop and how the pathway will lead up to the Xi Jinping's regime. Before we close up, uh, anything, any hints that you'd like to give us about the part two? 
Yeah, see, in this part, we have actually traced, uh, we haven't gone into the history of China, except that from where it became a republic, a turbulent period. And then uh, it, the Japanese had come in, the turbulence that took place, to the rise of the CCP. And then from there, we looked briefly at Mao's era and what the two great disasters during his period, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. We have just started on Tang Xiaoping's uh, period, yeah. where he connected back to Dr. Sun Yat-sen's grand concept. And before he has created the strategies, the first thing he has done is enunciated new metrics for what he termed as comprehensive national power. He then in the next part, we are going to touch how he and his two successors continued to uh, ensure how to develop China's CNP at the same time set the base for targeting other countries CNP so that that can be denuded and they can rise. So the next part we start looking at how China rises. So that is what we are going to. I think it will be interesting to find out and learn more about China. So till then, Jai Hind, sir.